Unlike other maneuvers that are taught during primary flight training, learning how to perform an emergency approach and landing is not intended to aid you in mastering other flight maneuvers. The purpose of learning how to perform this maneuver is so you have the knowledge and skills necessary to safely bring the airplane back to the ground in the remote chance you should experience a complete or partial engine failure during flight. Just as important as your ability to fly the airplane, your ability to recognize the situation, remain calm, assess your options, and apply good aeronautical decision-making can mean the difference between an event that everyone walks away from and one that ends tragically. It is for this reason that it is critical that you become proficient at this maneuver for your safety and that of your passengers. When performing an emergency approach and landing, there are some key things to remember. The first is that you have to assume that you will not be able to restart your engine. The second is that you want to be able to glide as far as possible to maximize your landing site options. And finally, you will need to select a landing area that will allow you to safely put the airplane on the ground with as little damage to the plane as possible. Too many pilots waste valuable time right after they lose their engine trying to get it restarted when they should instead be figuring out where they are going to land the plane. Once you have the plane trimmed up correctly and are heading towards a landing area, only then should you worry about getting the engine restarted. This is even more important when you're at lower altitudes because your options are going to be limited and you may have very little time to determine where you are going to land. The first thing that needs to be done is to trim the airplane for its best glide speed. In the Cessna, that speed is 68 knots at maximum gross weight. If you have flaps in, retract them. After the plane is trimmed for best glide speed and cleaned up, you will need to look around to assess your situation. There are two things that you will be looking for. You need to know the speed and direction of the wind, and you need to find a suitable place for landing. To determine the wind speed and direction, use the skills you previously learned in ground reference. Knowing the active runways at one or more airports in the vicinity will at least give you a ballpark idea of what the winds might be in your area. Of course, here at Embry-Riddle, the G1000 provides that information for us, but you should still know how to determine the winds without it. Once you've determined the winds, you need to find an area suitable for landing. Obviously, if there is an airport that you can reach, that would be the best place to head for. If there are no airports within gliding distance, you will need to select an off-airport landing site. The key here is knowing the glide ratio of your airplane and factoring in the effects of the wind. In the Cessna, the glide ratio is approximately 1.5 to 1. In other words, you can glide 1.5 miles for every 1,000 feet you are above the ground. Those numbers are for a calm day and do not take into consideration the wind. You will have to use your best judgment as to how far you will be able to glide in the existing wind conditions. But, as a generalization, if you choose a landing area that is upwind from your location, it will have to be closer than if you pick one downwind from your location. Another thing to consider when selecting an off-airport landing site is the type of surface you will be landing on. A long, hard surface is the ideal type of landing site to choose, but usually you will only find that at airports and on roadways. The next best type of surface you can land on is a long, smooth grass field. Whether it's an airport with a grass strip or a 50-acre sod farm, having either one of those options would be the next best thing to land in on a hard surface runway. But unless you are lucky enough to find one of those options, the most common suitable landing site will be farm fields. Of those fields, there are generally two different types, pasture lands and fields for growing crops. Each comes with its own pros and cons. With pastures, you won't have to worry about furrows, but you may have to contend with livestock. And although there may be no livestock to contend with on the fields in which crops are grown, you will have to pay attention to which way the land is tilled. Landing against the furrows can be almost as bad as running into a 2,000-pound cow. So if you have the good fortune to have multiple landing areas to choose from, these are the things that you should consider when making your decision as to which one to select. One last thing to consider when selecting landing sites is the size and number of fields you have to choose from. 
If there is an area that has a number of fields close together that are all large enough to satisfy your landing requirements, heading there may be your best option. That way, if need be, you can switch to a different field if there is an issue with the one you initially selected. Many times, a field that may have looked ideal for a landing site ends up having obstacles or hazards that you couldn't see from a distance. The other big advantage to having multiple fields to choose from is, if you should misjudge your approach to the initial field, you may still be able to make one of the other nearby fields. Keep in mind, landing with a direct headwind is the optimal situation, but sometimes it may be better to land with a crosswind if that means you have a longer landing area or a more conducive surface to land on. You will have to make that call based on the situation. Once you've selected a landing site, the next thing to do is determine how you will set up your approach. The idea is to get yourself in a position where you can fly your approach almost as if you had lost your engine on the downwind in the traffic pattern. The reason you want to do this is because it will make it easier for you to plan your approach from a pattern that you are already familiar with. There are two key points that help you plan your approach. The high key point is a beam the point of landing on what would be considered the downwind leg. The other key point is called the low key point, and it is on the base leg. You want to reach the high key point at 1,000 feet AGL and the low key point at 500 feet AGL. If you have plenty of altitude to reach your field, then you will want to proceed to the high key point and do one or more 360s to lose altitude. Time it so that at approximately 1,000 feet, you roll out from the last 360 on the downwind at the abeam point. The downwind should be flown the same distance from the field as you would fly from the runway in a normal traffic pattern. Do not extend the flaps at the abeam point. Instead, wait until you turn base and reach the low key point. Here, you will have to decide how your flight path looks. If your flight path looks good, hold off on adding flaps. If you feel you are a little high, go ahead and add 10 degrees of flaps. Once you turn final and know that you have the field made, extend the rest of the flaps. If you don't have enough altitude to reach the high key point at 1,000 feet, then you should proceed to the low key point. Whether it's a left base or a right base, you want to arrive at approximately 500 feet. Just as we discussed before, assess your flight path and decide whether to put in 10 degrees of flaps or not. When you turn final, add full flaps once the field is assured and complete the engine failure during flight checklist. Don't forget to properly prepare the plane and passengers for the landing by using the emergency landing without engine power checklist. Running this checklist will help to reduce the possibility of injuries to the passengers and greatly reduce the chance of a post-landing fire. Now that we've discussed the strategy of getting your airplane safely on the ground, we can talk about what you might be able to do to prevent having to do that. Once you have the plane trimmed for best glide speed and you're maneuvering towards your landing site, you can take time to try to get your engine started. The most common cause of engine failures is fuel exhaustion, so that is the first logical place to troubleshoot. Check the position of your fuel selector, fuel shutoff valve, and mixture. Don't just visually check. Make sure you physically confirm they are where they should be. Once you are sure the fuel controls are in the proper positions, you can attempt to restart. Use the engine failure during flight checklist as appropriate. One other thing to consider. If you changed something shortly before the engine started to have problems, you should undo that action. For instance, if you changed fuel tanks or leaned the mixture, put the fuel selector or mixture control back to where it was prior to the problem occurring. If the engine will not restart, squawk 7700 and make an emergency radio call on 121.5. Keep the call short and do not lose focus on flying the airplane. An engine failure is considered a distress call, so be sure to use the phrase mayday and not pan, which is used for urgent communications. There is very little someone on the ground can do for you in the case of an engine failure. Do not allow yourself to get into a drawn-out conversation with someone trying to walk you through what they think you should do.
The basic information you need to get across is who you are, where you are, and what your situation is. If you can provide an accurate description of your location and intended landing site, that should make it easier for them to find you. As a rule of thumb, once you are a thousand feet or lower, you should be concentrating on flying the plane and preparing for the landing. Engine failures are a very rare occurrence in general aviation, but they can happen. That is why the FAA mandates training in emergency approach and landing scenarios. So if it does happen to you, you will have been thoroughly trained and know exactly how to respond. Like so much of aviation training, pilots spend a lot of time becoming proficient at things they hope they never have to do. Such is the case with emergency approach and landings. But the hour spent training for this possible situation will be time well spent, and you will be a better, safer pilot for it.